The mission of adolescence is a complicated and far-reaching one, which explains why we've dedicated one monthly segment over the course of six months to addressing it. We've previously explored the world of the adolescent, as well as the challenges this transition poses for parents. Today, licensed family and marriage therapist John Williams and I discuss the point at which these two realities intersect in the communication between maturing adolescent and fallible parent. Welcome back, John. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, maybe the place to start uh, today is talking about communication and trust, which are certainly fundamental to any relationship. Right. Um, central, additionally, is the art of listening, often overlooked. Um, when is it best for us as parents to listen, and when is it maybe best for us not to listen and take another action? Okay. Well, I think that's a good point you made, and I think the, the big thing about when you shouldn't listen is in the height of the battle or the argument with the adolescent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason for that is that the adolescent usually is going to bring up issues, they're going to bring up topics as a way of kind of diverting perhaps from whatever the request might be and that kind of thing. So that's not when you want to, whenever you're doing any limit setting, whenever you're clarifying something, mm -hmm. that's when you don't want to get into listening. Mm -hmm. However, and I don't mean it in the, in the sense that you don't listen at all, but you don't want to keep going with it. You want to minimally listen. You want mm -hmm. to be respectful mm -hmm. in that situation, sure. but you don't want to allow it to go on and uh, you don't want to change your position. Unless uh, the adolescent can make a very good argument for it right at, right at that point in time. Otherwise, you stay with your position. Okay. On the other hand, you uh, parents should always listen. That's a huge part of the relationship. And mm -hmm. they should be available to the adolescent uh, mm -hmm. or to their child uh, mm -hmm. and, and as much as possible. And I think that's something that gets communicated both directly and indirectly. Sure. And the uh, just even if the even if the child doesn't take them up on that, uh, mm -hmm. just knowing knowing that the parent, which is a huge thing, knowing that the parent will listen to right. them if they want to talk, is a lot of security in and of itself. Right. Um, so, and then the other thing I think with in, in terms of listening is that I think that a lot of times uh, parents get into giving unsolicited advice mm -hmm. sure. and lecturing, and that again is something that. Something that people want to avoid. A lot of times you've lost your audience anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think especially in the when you get into the heat of the battle, which we're going to talk about pretty consistently today, you don't want to be starting to do lectures and that kind of thing. Most of the stuff that 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 we're focusing on should be happening outside of the heat of the battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. You should have discussions with the you know, with the adolescent and right. you should discuss this stuff, but you don't do it in the heat of the battle. Okay. All right. The other piece there, communication and trust um, is the issue of trust and certainly fundamental to, to a healthy parent-adolescent relationship. But, but just as typical maybe in the adolescent years is, is the, the opposite of, of, uh, of trust in, insofar as it's lying, yes? Right. Um, should we as parents take such dishonesties that perhaps were dealt um, personally or should we focus on the problem that got us to the lie in the first place. How, how do we approach this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very difficult. You don't want to take it too personally. And again, we're not um, lying is, is and, and being deceitful and secretive is a whole part of this particular s struggle that right. the adolescents are going through. You know, they're trying to separate. They're trying to become more independent. And part of that is going to be secretive. And that's why parents a lot of times complain that you know the child doesn't talk to me at all. Uh, and that so part of it is normal, um, and in terms of the line, yeah, that's uh, that's that's going to go along with it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I mean, when you when you when a parent experiences that, they're going to feel vile. You know, they have trust. They're going to feel violated. They're sure. going to feel disrespected. Right. They're going to feel angry. Right. Um, they're going to, and and so that's the normal feeling. And as you said, they're also, um, well. It's going to be hard not to take it personally, but they are going to sometimes feel that way. Yeah. And to the extent that they can manage this, they have to remember that it's a that the line is a normal part of adolescence, mm -hmm. and it, it is going to happen. And the thing is, is that when they to, to the best way for parents to deal with this is to not see it as a disaster, mm -hmm. not think that because they find their kid caught in a lie 
um, that that's going to be a long-term problem and that they're going to grow mm -hmm. up being con mm -hmm. men or, or that kind of thing. Right. And the, um, the, the, the other big problem that you kind of intimated in your question was that sometimes line becomes the central focus right. and it basically uh, becomes the primary thing. And the real issue that was there is become secondary to it. And a good example of that would be you got somebody that's in school, they're flunking courses, they're supposed to bring home some note from the teacher or from mm -hmm. the school. Mm -hmm. Of course they don't do that because they're right. going to get in trouble because they're flunking the course and then right. finally you know the parent finds out later where, uh, what about this note I didn't bring. And then all of a sudden the kid in fact has lied to them right. and right. they've been deceitful. Right. And if the parent then can focus on just the line and if right. they, but if they do that, they forget that the real problem was the fact that their their son or daughter is flunking in school. So is there is there an ordering to to maybe a, a, an ideal way to deal with 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 those that intersection? Is is it is it let's deal with the issue first? Let's deal with what happened at school and maybe how we can remedy that. Right. And then let's deal with why you felt you needed to lie to me. Right. Yeah. Yep. No, I think you, you you clearly have to go back and you have to give you have to give the the adolescent a sense that this you're not condoning lying, right. um, and it's not the thing that it's not the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but it's your attitude about it that it's not a disaster. And if you right. can start seeing it as part as the uh, part of the separation process, which is what adolescents are going through, right. it kind of go it kind of goes with it. And like I said before, the best thing parents can do is to be honest themselves in their interactions, and especially with the adolescent, because mm -hmm. the kid, uh, they're going to pick this up. Right. And so that's the best way to deal with it, I think. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit. Um, parents are certainly well aware that the adolescent years offer many new challenges and certainly some very real and palpable risks. Um, so it's understandable that we might, as parents, want to exert control over our children and their lives to the extent that we did when they were younger. Um, how realistic is, is that hope, is that expectation of exerting that control over our, our adolescents now? Well, it really changes because as the adolescent, as, as they're, they're a lot older than as you were referring to earlier on, and um, uh, what, what basically you're looking for when you talk about how much control they can have, I guess the best way to look at it is like it's a kind of imperfect control. Mm -hmm. And that there, there are, you clearly need rules, and there are going to be rules, but they're not going to be followed exactly, and they're, right. and they're not going to be followed all the time. Right. And I think that's the kind of flexibility. They're, they're, uh, it's one of the things that I think a parent of an adolescent has to start acknowledging is right. that it's not going to be perfect control. You might have had that when, the, when they were younger, especially right. if they were compliant. Right. But part of the whole adolescent experience is to, uh, you know, to challenge and, and, and fight things and uh, not give the parents control. Right. And so I guess, I guess yeah. another way to actually look at it is that sometimes when I deal with parents, they will be very upset about all the, you know, that they don't have the kind of control that they want. Mm -hmm. But then if you ask them the question of, uh, if you had perfect control, mm -hmm. what would be, that would be something you'd want to be worried about. Because if you had mm -hmm. perfect control, that would mean, what would that mean that the adolescent is doing? Are they going along with everything? Right. Right. And I think that's something you have to, right. that's another way to look at it. Right. The issue. And I think that we actually dealt with it to some degree in the last segment. Um, but certainly, depending upon our age as parents now, we come to the project of parenting with a very different set of expectations, perhaps, that our parents had uh, with us right. than, than is, the, is common in the culture today. Right. So, so we're certainly being asked to be very flexible in terms of how we approach mentally the project of right. parenting. Yeah. Well, that's yes. That's why I refer to the concept yeah. of imperfect control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you went back in time, thirty, mm -hmm. forty years, yeah, you would, you would, you would probably answer the question and say, no, it's realistic to be able to almost have, exactly, a, you yeah. know, a, a fuller control yeah. than what we're than what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, And I think that the culture would have supported that view. I mean, there are right. obviously uh, there would have been people maybe that were working in this area that would have understood, if you understood developmentally what was mm -hmm. going on with adolescents, they could have seen the thing. But I think the culture as a whole would have supported having, being closer to kind of a notion of perfect control. Right. But a, a useful illustration in, in this sense is, is the curfew. Mm -hmm. yeah? And there's the, you know, the, the statement from a parent, depending on the child's age and, and the parents, uh, you know, you need to be home by 10, you need to be home by 11, you need to be home by midnight, whatever, whatever fits your family. Right. And the child 
is, you know, it's 15 minutes after. It's right. maybe a half an hour after. Um, how, how do we negotiate that? It's, 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 it's a pushing of a boundary, right. perhaps. Maybe there's a reasonable explanation. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is, is really sort of a, a healthy way to, to approach that, that uh, conversation? Well, I think, uh, what, I think what that leads into is that there's probably, we can look at it from like maybe three different levels of either noncompliance or disobedience. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the, the, the most benign would be something like devious, something mm -hmm. like a devious defiance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a second thing might be more blatant direct defiance. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some examples of this. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third way would be when the behavior is really out of control and mm -hmm. um, it needs immediate response mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But okay. I think that, so we could take the example of, of, of the curfew. So let's say the curfew is uh, 1030 and uh, the adolescent comes home at, uh, you know, 10, 1045, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If that happens, basically, the curfew is actually working, especially if they come home 15 minutes later all the time. Right. I think what the challenge with a parent is, is that sometimes they will completely feel like it's, that they're not going along with it. But I think in this kind of a situation where it's more of a devious rule bending kind mm -hmm, of thing, mm -hmm. you want to go by uh, the spirit of the law and not, okay. and not the letter of the law. Okay. And that might be a way of looking at trying to understand it. And the, um, uh, you know, at the same time, you want to you want to still confront the fact that it was disobedient, and mm -hmm. it's not what the mm -hmm. plan was. You're mm -hmm. supposed to be home at 10:30, mm -hmm. but you don't have to overreact right. to the whole thing, and you you can restate that the rule still is it's 10:30. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And again, these are these interactions at the you know when when you're discussing this, you don't want to get into a long big right. lecture, but that would be the thing to do. Anything else for the sake of and on the issue of parent-adolescent relationship and dynamics that would be uh, be useful to, to say at this point as we wrap up? Um, no, I think, I think a lot of what we've been talking about is trying to maintain a perspective with the whole thing, not get too drawn into the, you know, the, the small details of everything, trying to remain flexible but yet firm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like these are mutually exclusive yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the same time. And maybe the biggest issue is if you can understand the developmental tasks of the adolescent as they go through all this stuff, right. things will make more sense to you. They have to battle you. They have to separate. <laughs> they have to fight. Right. Um, it's all part of the whole thing. And, right. if you, and, but, and if you have that perspective, it will make things a lot right. easier. Right. Not easy, but, a, but quite easier. a bit easier. And it might look very different from, from the transition that we made away from our parents 20, 30, 40 years ago. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a different time now. Yeah. And I think that it's, you know, and that, and that again is, is very hard. I think a lot of times people remember yeah, sure. Remember that, um, and I deal with parents all the time that that, that, that that they they just can't be flexible about this stuff, and they say that uh, when I grew up, this is the way it was, and when my father grew up, this is the sure. way it was, and and that's yeah. and so that that that's can be a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, it's fitting that we end this segment uh, with the stories John John just provided, as humor is key to making it through the transition that is adolescence in one piece. If you'd like to view this or any of our previous segments or to find further resources, we invite you to visit us online at news.acmi.tv. And please do join us again next month when we'll be exploring some of the serious risks and pitfalls confronting our children today, including bullying, issues of body image, and stress. For John Williams, I'm Peter Bermudas for Arlington Public News.